How's everybody doing? All right, good morning. My name's Derek. If you're new with us, um, I lead our church here at Lake Springs, and we're glad uh, you're hanging out with us today. Uh, make sure you come and see us after church, uh, and we'll have a gift for you. Just say thanks for hanging out. Um, so uh, open your Bibles, if you have them, to Mark chapter 1. Uh, we are finishing Mark chapter 1 today. We started it at the beginning of this month, and we're going to finish Mark chapter 1, uh, so you can open up. If you don't have a Bible, there are these Bible journals in the seats, which are great for if you like to highlight or you like to write uh, next to your Bible, and you don't necessarily want to do that in your very expensive, nice Bible, I'm sure that you spent lots of money on. Uh, and uh, so if you, if you did uh, grab, one of those, uh, grab one of those Bible journals and follow along. Uh, hey, uh, welcome all the kids in the room. Are you all glad to be here? Yeah, did you guys have fun? We're glad to have you. Uh, and so you guys can follow along too, all right? Follow along and, um, and tell your parents about what you learned at church today. And, uh, and I'll just go ahead and, and tell you, children, that your parents have told me they're going to give you $5 if you can tell them what you guys learned at church today, all right? I just, that, that may or may not be true. I might just lied from stage, okay? So uh, I just, as, as David said, we're all of us on stage, are, have, we have our own problems, <laughs> So, anyway, um, yeah, so we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. We're going to end Mark chapter 1 today. If you want to catch up on the series, you weren't here for the beginning part of the series, uh, you can do that on YouTube or on our church center page. But uh, we're going to start in verse 35, all right? Verse 35. So turn over there. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 says this. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, that he is Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Well, let's go to the next towns that I might preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling and said to him, If you will... You can make me clean. And moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in a desolate place. And people were coming to him from every quarter. All right, so if you know anything about me and you have been around our church for the last two and a half years, you know I'm going to love this passage from the outset because Jesus uh, withdraws from the crowd and heads off into the desolate place. Uh, that desolate place um, is, uh, is actually called, uh, in the Greek, it's the word aremos. Aramos. And the Aramos, uh can be translated in lots of different ways. Like when Jesus was being led by the Spirit into the wilderness, the word wilderness is Aramos. All right, so he's being led into the wilderness. Uh, that, that's that's Aramos. Desert is Aramos. Deserted place, Aramos. But but what I think is actually happening here, if you read through the context and you understand the context of what where where Jesus is at, is is I think that this is probably best translated the quiet place, the quiet place, and. Uh, that's because Jesus is in Capernaum. If you know from last week, Jesus was in Capernaum. He was at his friend's house, Peter and Andrew, uh, and a bunch of people came to see him, and they were in Capernaum. But Capernaum is this very lush green land in Israel, and so there's, it's, it's unlikely that he's in the desert or that he's in the wilderness or anything else like that. So that's how you can kind of understand. He probably just withdrew. He probably didn't go hours away. He just withdrew a short distance away from the house somewhere in Capernaum and probably found a quiet place to be with God and pray with God. And so this is where we find Jesus. And, uh, and so uh, Peter, Peter comes 
and runs out to Jesus. And as Peter often does, he, he is very, very bold. And, uh, and Peter's just experienced a spiritual high. Can we say that? Can we, have you guys ever had this? He had a spiritual high? Um, maybe you've only had spiritual lows, and that's okay. Maybe today will be that spiritual high for you. I don't know. But, uh, but, but, but if, you, if you've ever had a spiritual high, this is where Peter's at. He's had a spiritual high. He's just seen uh, someone have a demon cast out on Sabbath at the synagogue. And then he shows up at his house, and his mother-in-law is healed. And then all these other people people at sundown. I mean, Peter's house is the center of the city where everybody wants to be. It is like where everybody is coming to hang out with Jesus and be healed and be, and, and just be renewed. And, uh, and so Peter's like in the, in the, in the, in the throes of all of this and he races out and he finds Jesus and he's like, Jesus, everyone's looking for you, right? Which is short for, hey, bro, I got a bunch of people around my house right now looking for you, and we got work to do, man. Come on, like, we're supposed to heal these people. We're supposed to do something for these people. And Jesus looks at Peter, and he says, why don't we just, why don't we go the other direction? Isn't that kind of weird? Right? I mean, you got all these people waiting to see Jesus, wanting Jesus to heal them, wanting Jesus to do something, and Jesus is like, well, let's, let's go to the next towns, that I might preach there too, because that is why I came. We, we should underline that and we should circle that, because earlier in Mark chapter 1, it says that Jesus came preaching the gospel of God and telling people to repent and believe. This is why Jesus comes, okay? So the, the miracles are great. They're great. But that's not what Jesus' mission ultimately is. And we need to pay attention to that. And so I'd circle that, I'd highlight that, I'd underline that, I'd make sure that we don't miss that this is what Jesus is about. He's about preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and that the kingdom of God has come in him that you might repent and believe and follow Jesus. That's his point. That's his hope. Is that you might repent, believe, and follow him. And so... Uh, Jesus says, let's go, let's go to these other places because this is why I've come. And so it says he's gone, goes throughout Galilee, goes through all the little towns in Galilee, and he begins to preach in the synagogue. I love the fact that Jesus has a strategy. I don't know if you like you, I don't know if you're a leader, but like as a leader, I like strategy. And so I like that Jesus had a strategy. Je Jesus was like, we're going to go to the synagogue. That's where we're going to find the people that we want to try and get to repent and believe and follow me. So let's go to the synagogue. He's got a strategy. So he goes there, and then it says that he casts out uh, demons. And, and this, this idea, okay, this idea that Jesus is casting out demons, you'll notice it, it does not say that he, 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 it does not talk about one specific instance where somebody came to him and he cast out their demon. But he talks about casting out demons. And this idea, I think what Mark's trying to betray and what Mark is trying to lay out for us is that Jesus is exercising authority over evil and over Satan. He has ultimate authority over the darkness and over the chaos like we talked about last week. And it poses no threat to him at all. He's not threatened by it. And it's in this moment. We don't know how many days have passed at this point, how many days has Jesus been on his traveling preaching circuit or whatever. And, uh, but, but he shows up and there's a leper that comes and kneels down before him and says, if you will, you can make me clean. He doesn't say, um, I, I, can you? Will you? He's like, I believe you can do it. If, if you just will, you can do it. I love the faith that's there um, in this leper. Um, and, and he's obviously seen Jesus heal or he's heard stories of Jesus heal. He's done something to, to understand and know that Jesus is the guy that I want to bow down in front of and who can actually help me with my condition. And so he has no doubt in his mind that Jesus is the guy. And, and it says that this request or this statement, this statement moves Jesus to pity. Now, this word moved to pity um, is oftentimes also translated had compassion. Jesus had compassion for them or on them. This idea of compassion is one um, I don't know very well, um, to be honest. It's one of the places where I need to be more like Jesus. Uh, but like, uh, and anyone who works with me can tell you that. Uh, but, 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 like the, but, I, but I am working on it. So, um, but this idea of compassion, it's empathy, it's feeling other people's pain. And I think that this is one of those points where we need to stop for just a second and recognize what we find in Jesus because of who he is. We find this good God who is not so distant from us 
um, but who is near enough and he actually feels our pain. He feels our angst. He feels our anger. He feels our sadness. He feels our frustration. And no matter what you're going through, no matter what you have gone through, you you will find a good companion in Christ. Like whatever you came in here feeling today, no matter how good or how bad your week was, no matter how crazy last night's Halloween celebration was, like you have a good companion in Christ. He understands it. And what you have seen and what you will see is that he knows what it's like to be tempted and also betrayed. He knows what it's like to have people use him for their own benefit and also curse him. He knows what it's like to walk through life as a child born out of wedlock and be dismissed by his entire community and thought of as crazy by his family. He knows what it's like to be, to be in a situation where he loses a close friend like Lazarus and also what it's like to wrestle with close friends like James and John and Peter. Jesus knows the things that we're going through. He knows what we have been through. And he can empathize with us in every way. That's what Hebrews tells us. As we have a high priest who can empathize with us in every way. He understands us and he understands what we've gone through in every way. And so you see this here. He knows what you're going through. He feels it. He sees it. He knows that you live in a sinful world. He knows that you're struggling to follow him. He knows it. And he's, off, he's offering compassion. He's offering grace, kindness, and love. I love how in this story what it says is that he reached out and touched the leper. No one would have done that. No one would have reached out and actually touched the leper. They would have been like, oh, I'm not going to do that. That's dangerous. <laughs> uh, but Jesus, again, you see no fear. This poses no threat to him. And he shows this leper, who probably hasn't been touched by another human being in a really, really long time, that he loves him and he understands his pain. He reaches out and touches him and he heals him. And it's fantastic. But then he says, or then the scriptures say, that he charged him sternly not to say anything to anyone. Okay? Now, if you're a parent in the room, you understand this, right? Can I get an amen? Amen. Because you, you, have, you have looked at your child and you have said to them, hey, whatever you do, don't do that, okay? And you did it pretty sternly. And they were like, the, uh, they did the exact opposite, like right after you got done saying it. So God can empathize with us in this as well because he's got a bunch of dumb children too, okay? Uh, so, um, so I love you, Zoe. Uh, she sat front and center, guys. She sat front and center. Anyway, uh, so, so here's, here's the deal, all right? Here's the deal is that, that, that this guy, he goes out, and he just immediately does what Jesus told him not to do. Like, which for you and I, we're probably like, yeah, you go get him, dude. Because, like, who can keep that quiet, right? I mean, he's just healed of leprosy. How's he supposed to not say something? Like, we're probably thinking, like, why would Jesus say that? That doesn't make any sense. And can I just, can I just say something for a second? What, what we have to realize is why Jesus says and tells him not to go say anything. It's because his mission is bigger than this leper. If you go back to verse 36, which I told you to underline and highlight, and if you listen to me, and you would have done what I said, like this leper would have done what Jesus said, you would have, but he he says, I've come for this reason. I've come to preach. I go into towns and preach. That's why I've come. And what happens when he heals this leper, and then the leper goes out and starts to speak, is Jesus can't go into the towns anymore. Now, this is... This is one of those moments where I think we have to ask ourselves some pretty important questions. Because what happens here is this leper disobeys Jesus and his direct disobedience of what Jesus has called him to do, it it keeps Jesus from doing what he has set out to do. Now, I know that there are many people who believe that God will do whatever he wants. 
And I will say, God can do whatever he wants, and he probably still will accomplish whatever he wants. But, but, the, but the truth that we have to grab a hold of is that our disobedience can keep him from doing what he wants, how he wants to do it. Now, your disobedience can actually impact if Jesus is able to do what he wants to do. And so we have to be careful. What, we do, what, what happens is Jesus is no longer able to go into the towns, and he then r- reserves himself to find himself back in this desolate place. We see this word again, the Eremos. This is where Jesus is at. And this is what happens. And so this leper declares what God has done for him, and people come flocking. But the problem is, is that they, they want to get close to Jesus, They want to get close to Jesus because of what he can do for them, but they don't really want to get close to Jesus because they don't really care about following him. Do you see this? Like they have no interest in the message of Jesus saying, repent and believe and follow me. They have no interest in that. What they want is they want Jesus to fix their problems. Do we ever come to Jesus like this? Like, do we ever just, like, show up at Jesus' doorstep and are like, hey, Jesus, fix all my problems, right? Like, can you fix the financial issues that I'm having? Can, can you get me that job that I've been trying to find? Can you heal me of whatever sickness or whatever issue I'm dealing with? Like, we come to Jesus oftentimes with our own agenda for our own benefit, not because we love him. And, and, and what you see from Jesus is that he distances himself from these people. He distanced himself from these people in Capernaum and he went the other direction and he distances himself from the people in the towns who are just hoping to get Jesus to do something for them. But they have no interest in actually repenting, believing, and following him into his kingdom. And so we have to be careful. We have to ask ourselves, are we doing the same thing? Because there there is the danger of that. There is the danger of that. Where we can just make Jesus something that we use for our own benefit. And when we do, man, it's a, it's a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. We should not do that. We should make sure that we pursue Jesus with a, with a pure heart and right motives. And um, it reminds me of the story in the Old Testament of three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right? This is, this is for all the kids in the room. Do you guys know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Have you guys heard about this? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what happens to them, kids? What happens? Huh? No? Okay. They get put in a fiery furnace, all right? So they get thrown into a fiery furnace, and, and, and they aren't scared. They say, they say to the king, like, well, you can throw us into a fiery furnace. That's fine, because our God will save us. But here's the cool thing about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that they believe God will save them, yes, but they say this. They say, but even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, we're still going to praise him. Even if he doesn't, we're still going to trust him. Even if he doesn't, we're still going to follow him. Do you see the difference in those two things? You have a bunch of people who believe Jesus can do something for them, but, but if he doesn't, are they going to be around? No. No. What Jesus is looking for is he's looking for people who, even if he doesn't fix all of our problems, we're still going to follow him. We're still going to praise him. We're still going to give him glory and honor because that's who he is and that's what he deserves because he's a king and he has a kingdom. And so we have to realize, we have to realize that the mission that Jesus has is bigger than us. It's bigger than just us. I believe that you have a great story to tell I have a great story to tell. I have a great testimony to speak, right? But, but here's, the, here's the truth, right? Um, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll tell a story about something that Jesus has done for us. Somehow Jesus has done something in our life, and we'll look at somebody and we'll say, what Jesus did for me, he will do for you. And that may or may not be true. And we should be careful about saying things that may or may not be true. Here's what you should say, is if you repent and believe and follow Jesus, he can give you the most abundant life because he promises to do so. And that doesn't mean he's going to fix all your problems, but it does mean he loves you and he saves you and he forgives you and he can use you despite all your many problems. 
That's the story we should tell. And that's the, the way we should, should share our story. Is not that, oh, like, man, God healed me. He can heal you or he will heal you. He can, sure. But he doesn't heal everybody. He doesn't heal everybody. But what he will do is he will offer salvation and grace to everyone who repents and believes. And so that should be our message. That should be the story that we tell. Is that I was a dead sinner. And Jesus stepped out of heaven, died on a cross, and he saved me. And so now I'm turning my life from the, the old sinful ways I used to live to, to walk in a newness of life and follow him. That's the hope we have. Now... Um, there's another aspect of this that's really cool, too, about the story of this leper. So in the first century, we have to put on our first century hat. Okay, we've got to remove ourselves from the 21st century, put on our first century hat, and know that leprosy was like a legitimate, difficult thing that was dealt with. And, and lepers would find their way amongst the people from time to time, but they'd always be clearly designated as a leper, but whether by the way they were dressed or because they would carry around some sort of barrier that wouldn't allow other people to get near them. Uh, because if they touched, if anyone touched them, they would be infected. And so this was a way in which they were able to, to kind of keep themselves at, at distance so that no one would be infected by uh, their leprosy. And so, uh, so what, we, what we see happen is, is no one is cured of leprosy in the first century. They're just cast out of the people and put on the outskirts of the city to live amongst a leper colony. That's where they live. And, um, and although they'll make their way amongst the people, they live with the lepers outside of the community and outside of the camp. And, uh, and so no one went out there and none of them were finding healing. They just slowly deteriorated until they died. And so Jesus, to, to touch someone and heal a leper, was seen to be as impossible as raising someone from the dead. And so Jesus, to do this, this might be his most significant miracle. His most significant miracle, because what he's doing is he's showing, I, don't, I can exercise authority over most difficult things. And he's going to prove that he can even exercise authority over death. Amen? Amen. So like that's, that's what Jesus is pointing to. He's pointing to the fact that like nothing can really hold me back. Not even death which is a really beautiful thing in light of being now in the 21st century and knowing the, the hope of the resurrection of Christ, right? So that's, that's just a really cool aspect to this story that we might miss if we're just reading it as 21st century readers going, oh yeah, look, he healed another person, right? But what he's doing here is really significant. He's exercising his authority over the most powerful things, including death. But here's the, and, and you guys, if you know me, you know I'm going to bring it back to this, so. But here's, here's the interesting thing that I find is so, so compelling about this, is that this, uh, this act by this leper drives Jesus back out into the Aramos, drives him out of the city into the Aramos. And this is now where people, if they want to hear Jesus teach, if they want to hear Jesus uh, speak, if they want to be healed, if they want to experience what Jesus has for them, they have to withdraw from the city and they have to go meet Jesus in the Aramos. They have to go meet Jesus in the desolate place, in the quiet place. They have to remove themselves from the noise and make their way out to him because he's no longer moving into the city. He's moving out into the quiet place. And I don't know about you, but this kind of begs uh, to me, it, it shows me that, um, that there's a shift that takes place and that, that in order and what is required in order to meet and be with Jesus is now um, to withdraw a little bit, to go out there into the quiet place to be with him. Now, I want you to look at me for a second. Everyone's eyes up. Everyone's eyes up, okay? I'm going to let these girls take a seat real quick. You guys are so cute. We're so glad you're here. Like, so glad. Um, everyone look at me real quick. If you think that you can have a deep connection 
an abiding relationship with Jesus without removing yourself from the noise, the busyness, the frantic pace of the city, and by the city I mean most of our lives, that run a hundred miles an hour, 24 hours a day and seven days a week, if you think you can have an abundant relationship with Jesus Christ and never retreat to the quiet place, you are mistaken. You are mistaken. You can come to church, but oftentimes church is just one more busy activity that we throw into our week. We have to figure out a way to develop a rhythm of withdrawing from the noise to go be with Jesus in the quiet place regularly, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly. I mean, we need to figure out different rhythms to be able to do this because the more and more we try and engage with Jesus in the, the frantic city life that we live, I'm telling you right now, the less and less we will find him. The less and less we will find him. It doesn't mean he's not there at times. It doesn't mean he doesn't show up at times. It just means it's a lot harder to find him. And I, I personally, <laughs> I just don't know. I, 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 and, I would, and I would venture to say that if you aren't finding space to be with Jesus in the quiet place um, on a regular basis, you're not growing as a follower of Jesus. You're not growing. You're not encountering him in a deep way. You're not hearing him speak to you in a way that challenges you and moves you and changes you. Okay? Now, <clears throat> if you don't know this, um, most people who call themselves Christians, okay, most people in our world who call themselves Christians, which doesn't mean a whole lot because a lot of people call themselves Christians. A lot of people call themselves things. We, we can adopt any title we want. But a lot of, like, a lot of people um, call themselves Christians. So I don't know how much weight I can give to this, but out of the people who call themselves Christians, the majority of them, um, on average, spend seven and a half hours a day on digital media. In taking digital media, those same people spend an average of 30 minutes a day in spiritual content. And most of that is in taken through a screen or through headphones or something. Very rarely is it just sitting down in the quiet place and praying or reading the scriptures. And it's, it's sad, guys. We are so addicted we are so addicted. My generation, millennial generation, touches their phone over 2,000 times a day. It is disgusting what we call our faith and our Christianity if all of this digital media gets more time and attention than Jesus. It's the world we live in. And I'm telling you right now, guys, we have an enemy, and if he can keep us distracted... And looking at small seven-inch screens, he wins. He wins. And I don't want him to win. Hopefully, you don't want him to win. And so for the next three weeks, we're going we're gonna to dive into this practice of solitude, of getting alone with Jesus in the Aramos together as a church. This is a, we're going to teach about it on Sunday morning, but we're also going to have our life groups go through a curriculum with you guys on, on how to do it. You can practice it in those small groups. You talk about your experience and how that's going and what that looks like and all of these other kinds of things. But the goal is, is to, to help us move ourselves from the, from the frantic pace of life in the city to go into the Aramos to be with Jesus, to go be with him and let him go to work on our soul. You know, we live, we live in a world that, that, um, that disagrees with Jesus when Jesus says, what good is it for, the, for a man? What good is it to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Everyone in our world says, let's chase the world. Let's chase what the world can give us. Let's gain everything we can. Let's take hold of everything we can hand, right? This is like the world we live in. And this is what keeps us busy. And we're just, we're just hamsters on a wheel trying to accomplish, trying to run faster and go further. 
And Jesus says, why don't you just, just stop? You're losing your souls. You're losing your souls. And he says, come. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's where he calls us. Stop racing around trying to gain the whole world. You're losing your soul. Find, find yourself moving out into the quiet place to be with Jesus. We want to help you with that as a church. We want to help you with that as a church because we believe, we believe if you go there, you'll find him there. And he'll do a great work. He'll do a great work in your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. And thank you for just the chance that we have to be here to worship you, to praise you, to give you glory and honor. God, thank you for uh, the kids that are in the room today. Thank you for just the life and the energy that they have. Uh, thank you for just the, the parents that are so invested in them and getting them to church and, and having them here. God, it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing to see their faces. And God, uh, we pray that you would, uh, you would work in their lives in a mighty way, that you would raise them up to be resilient disciples in this crazy, chaotic, fast-paced world. And I pray that you would raise up in us as the leaders and as the adults and as the ones trying to, to shape and mold these young, young people, God, that you would, you would create in us that same desire, that same desire to move out to the Aramos to be with you, to find you there in the quiet place that you might move and speak to us in a deep and meaningful way. But God, it's going to be hard. It's a hard struggle to make time in the midst of calendars that are stacked full and an and endless to-do list of, of things to do and get done and accomplished and endless places that we can visit and travel and want to see and experience and all, it's going to be so difficult. Amidst the noise of, of a 24-7 news cycle that when something happens, we know about it 10 minutes later and, 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 and an endless, endless uh, ringing of notifications that come on our, on our phones that, 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 that say that, hey, there's another post to look at on social. Like, God, we, we need your help to just, to just get ourselves into a place and into a space and a mindset of where we give you our whole selves our undivided attention, that we might not be distracted and so distracted that the enemy steals away our very soul. And so God, may, may we chase after you with everything we are and all that we have. May we forsake everything else just to find and be with you. God, we love you. Thank you so much for Jesus. We pray that your power be made perfect in our weakness in this, God. In the powerful and mighty name of Jesus, amen. So we're going to move to the tables now. There are four tables throughout the room, two up here on the front and two in the back. And uh, on the night Jesus was betrayed by his closest counterparts and closest friends, um, he broke bread with them. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he held it up and he said, uh, like the bread, this is the cup. It's the blood of a new covenant, of a new promise that I've washed away your sins by letting my blood be shed on the cross. And so this is the hope we have. We come to remember that his broken body and his shed blood are what give us hope. It's not any amount of striving, any amount of goodness, it's not even any amount of time that we spend with him in which we find salvation. We find salvation in him and him alone because he loves us and he dies for us. And so uh, may we take hope in this. May we, may we take hope in the broken body and shed blood of Jesus. Maybe this is the time where you take this back to your seat and you spend some time just confessing your sins before God. Or maybe you spend some time celebrating salvation and that you've been saved by this body and this blood. Whatever it is, feel free to, to, to go whichever direction God leads you. 
during this next time. Let's pray and uh, over communion, and then and then you guys can come and take. God, thank you for giving us emblems to remember this by. Thank you for giving us your broken body and your shed blood, this bread and this cup to, to take and to remember, to eat and to drink, that we may never forget what you've done for us. That we may never forget that the thing that uh, was most needing to be dealt with in our life was not uh, a, a sickness or a disease, um, but, but ultimately it was sin. And you came to take care of sin and, and paid the price for our sin on the cross. So God, we revel in that now. We're so grateful for that right now. And we praise you for that in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Why don't you guys stand and move to the table whenever you feel led.